Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to be here. Uh, any, any of you see the movie Argo? Yeah? Okay, you remember what it felt like when they crossed the border? That's what it felt like coming to a free country. <laughs> uh, it felt so good. You could land and breathe the air and hoist a drink and, uh, and, and say more. Uh, so uh, thank you for fighting the good fight and keeping the doors of uh, freedom, justice, and the North American way open to the possibilities of the future. I spoke at a privacy conference um, shortly after the financial crash happened, and uh, some of your uh, colleagues came up to me throughout the conference and said, so how are your banks doing, eh? And uh, gained a lot of respect for what a, a measured, structured environment can provide because it provides more freedom, maximum freedom to be spontaneous uh, and do the things that count. Uh, so uh, this is a very serious topic. I, I'm going to uh, try to do justice to it. I came to the topic of the impact of dark knowledge and secrets out of my own experience. I've been uh, around this space for almost 24 years uh, since leaving my former career. And I've gotten to know people uh, who have shared uh, many, many of the consequences of doing the kind of work that many of you do, most of you do, all of you do, one way or another in security uh, and intelligence, and the two are more and more difficult uh, to distinguish from one another. Uh, I was trying to engage people once upon a time in a bioethics uh, unit of a medical college where I lived uh, with the fact that torture was becoming institutionalized. This was before we knew it. In other words, the New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, had not yet done the stories that revealed the extent of rendition and, and torture. Uh, and I was talking to people who uh, did torture people and uh, created conditions that they called oops deaths. You know, when you're working with someone and suddenly, oops, they're gone. And you have to call in a physician to falsify the death certificate and say it was from natural causes. Uh, and I, I was talking to people who were tortured. Uh, and so I was trying to get these people to engage with the fact that the CIA and others were now formalizing these procedures. And uh, the therapist who ran the program told me to read about trauma. And I did, and I went back to her and I said, thanks, that was interesting. She said, do you know why I told you to read about it? And I said, of course, because I'm talking to people who have been traumatized. She said, anything else? And when we're in denial, we don't know we're in denial. That's why it's called denial. Uh, I said, no, I don't see anything else. And she said, you're showing all the symptoms of secondary trauma by engaging with these people, by taking in what they're saying. Uh, you need to be debriefed. And she suggested doing certain things, which I'll suggest at the end of this talk, we can all do just to maintain ourselves in as sane and reasonable posture as, as we can, given what we now call the consequences of moral harm which is working in situations which ultimately take us over and compel us to do things which violate our own conscience, uh, and, and simply the post-traumatic stress of dealing with some of the things that uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, illustrate. So it's a serious talk. Um, the upbeat part is that we're resilient and we're free and we're capable of responding to whatever life brings. Uh, spy stories are, are very uh, sexy for a lot of people. Uh, they, they're cool, um, but then you get into the game and it's, uh, it's, it's not cool at all. Uh, I don't think I've shared this anecdote before, but uh, let me share it with you, give you an example of the kind of thing that can happen to someone. Early in my career, I was assigned to a small group working to develop a means to access information about what the enemy was doing that was a serious threat to the United States. The way the group was focusing uh, had little prospect of succeeding, but was being encouraged by management to keep working on it. I thought about the problem and realized one could capitalize on some aspects of physics, this is a scientist, that appeared to offer great promise. I presented my thinking and suddenly found myself called in by management to be grilled on who had told me about what I was proposing. I said, nobody told me, I'm a physicist, and my knowledge led me to this. I was then told I now had to be briefed into a highly compartmentalized, very sensitive operation that I had stumbled upon. 
The thought this raised in my mind was that my management knew this solution was being pursued, but still had our group working on a not needed initiative that had little prospect of success anyway. Was our group being used as a cover? Could I be being used in a futile pursuit without being informed as such? Such an experience leads to a distrust of the organization that never goes away. It can start a path to paranoid thinking that is readily reinforced throughout one's career. Another friend at NSA told me that he only recently, when it was declassified, learned that a program on which he had worked uh, earnestly, as this senior person had at NSA, uh, the entire program and all those who worked on it did not know that the program itself, while it also accomplished what it set out to do, that wasn't the real purpose for which it was established. It was a cover for some other initiatives, and they themselves didn't know it and never knew it until the program itself was declassified. Uh, it, it, it's kind of like the uh, uh, reason given for looking for the Soviet sub, the nuclear sub that went down in the Pacific some years ago. Um, diving companies were set up by the CIA covertly as the proprietaries, and their stated purpose was to recover manganese nodules from the sea uh, in a more efficient way. And while it also did that, it resulted in the cover story being also true. There were levels of truth uh, that went all the way up to the point being to recover the uh, Soviet sub and learn its secrets thereby. Uh, <clears throat> I talked to one of the lead people on that, uh, on that project. You know how it works. They, they all fly to one place. You go to an elevator, you go down 40, uh, 40 floors into the abyss of the earth. You have a meeting in a secure place. You come up, the meeting never happened. You disperse, there are no records, there's no history. Uh, history is, is like listening to a symphony in a hallway with a lot of dead spots. I once asked the uh, lead historian at NSA, so what can you and I discuss with a reasonable assurance that by the words we use, we're referring to the very same events, meaning them in the same way? And he said, anything at all up until 1945. Uh, and, and yes, you laughed, and we laughed, uh, but it wasn't only a joke, it was a joke, but it was also true that the porting of the world of the OSS in World War II secrecy of necessity into the national security state in which we now all live and move and have our very being uh, meant that the procedures and protocols of that state have resulted in a different kind of hyper-real environment uh, in which we have to live. This gentleman went on, much later I was informed by another manager, he was battling to have me briefed, included on another highly sensitive initiative. He was concerned that the mix of people involved could be led astray, and said management was balking and in including me, which just drove my boss to be more concerned. I was briefed into it and found it was an experiment being run by a contractual organization to try to verify a hypothesis. It was fundamentally a scientific experiment. The others in the group were engineers, not scientists. As I examined the protocols of the experiment, I found holes where one could manipulate and control the results to be what one would like them to be. I raised these to our group and said we needed to revise the protocol. If the hypothesis was demonstrated to be valid, the government would spend millions of dollars pursuing it, and the contracted organization would make a considerable profit. We needed to be as sure as we could be that the experimental results were valid. I met huge resistance. The contractors balked. The next week I was called in and formally debriefed from the effort. The debriefing included that I could never say anything about the project, nor even acknowledge its existence without being subject to serious punishment. This illustrates, he said with subtlety, the tools that exist in our domain to control a human being and the dilemmas into which one can be thrust and with which one has to live. This is an example of moral harm moral harm. All of the principles of his scientific training and focus uh, had to be set aside on behalf of a um, really internal nefarious purpose. So um, that's what can happen to you in security. That's what can happen to you in intelligence. And by the time it happens, you've already committed. The second foot has left the cliff, which is the definition of commitment. Uh, and uh, these are the kinds of things that can happen when you're really on the front lines. Quote, the trauma can last a long time. Those of us who were countering ter terrorism before 9-11 had no time to grieve or otherwise deal with it at the time. Consequently, we are still dealing with it. 
I saw a psychiatrist after 9-11, he talked about fighter pilot syndrome. One is fine and appears to be coping well and while the tension is on, but once it lets up, brain chemistry goes crazy. When bin Laden was killed, I watched TV coverage of the party outside the White House and I sobbed for an hour. Not out of regret for his death, but because of everything that came before. It takes so long to train a good counterterrorism analyst, yet managers are careless in burning their people out so quickly. Somehow we have to make it viable as a long-term job. And that, if anything, is the essence of this presentation, that your work is a long-distance run, not a sprint. And while there are intermittent things you can do, there are larger things you can do to manage over a lifetime, over the cycle, the arc of your, your life and engagement. Uh, the consequences of necessity which come from doing what you are doing. So I'm not bashing Intel. We have to do this work, and we haven't found a way to do it cleanly. Uh, it's, it's just not the way the world is set up, humans being what we are. Uh, maybe we'll be able to tweak ourselves going forward and come up with better uh, varieties of human uh, or subspecies to develop into species, uh, and then our successor species will eradicate us, eat us, and move on with a uh, higher moral purpose. But the very eating suggests that might not be down <laughs> coming. So we don't know how to deal with reality except uh, forthrightly. Philip K. Dick said, uh, reality is that which refuses to go away just because you don't believe in it. Uh, so it, it will come back again and again. So this is not a moralistic talk. It's about the consequences we all experience because they're significant. And they do not go away because we minimize or rationalize or deny the reality. The nature of the work in and of itself can cause trauma. It can tie people into ethical knots. It can fray bonds of trust and it can lead to substance abuse, relationship hopping, divorce, and suicide. I carry on my brain, said one senior professional to me, 23 suicides. 23 suicides, the most recent are senior people at the agency who could not live with what they knew. Not merely what they did, but simply what they knew. So, so, it does apply. It does apply to security as well as intelligence. When you join an intelligence service at the start of your career, you're involved usually in low-level apprentice-like tasks. Uh, they're usually far removed from traumatic action or profound moral considerations, and you don't make the decisions anyway. You're assimilated into the environment, into the culture so quickly, you become part of it. That's why Timothy Leary said, you never get the truth from a company memo. The higher up the ladder you go, the more you become assimilated, like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Anyone remember that book or movie, Invasion of the Body Snatchers? People look like your neighbors, but when they open their mouth, there's a kind of wailing alien sound because they become something else over time because the culture has assimilated them and they have compromised themselves in order, in order to, uh, to keep dealing with it. Um, but in the course of your career, your actions and decisions slowly grow into being, like the frog being heated almost imperceptibly for most of us. One may suddenly awake to where you are and realize that you haven't been prepared for this and realize one is now deeply into the situation, well beyond a point that one would have stepped into if it had been presented from the start. And when this is the case, it is always too late to step back. As a friend at CIA said, how do you deal with it if you discover that you have sold your soul and you don't realize it until after the transaction has been completed? Okay. Okay, are we light enough now? Are we? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to include uh, periodic jokes, and, uh, but uh, you know, serious stuff. Uh, the same waking up moment applies to technologies you develop. Whether it's weapons you're working with, information weapons, or what, genetic modification, or total surveillance, there's tension. And just because you can do something, should you do it? It's true of many technologies that once you start, you can't go back. Some of us are smart enough, said my friend, 
And excuse me when I use language like this, it's because I'm quoting. I would never myself use language like this, not in a public setting. But he said some of us are smart enough or in on enough to be scared absolutely shitless of the possibilities or trends that we see. Uh, for example, working on autonomous robotic weapons, which you know, driverless cars are nothing compared to pilotless drones, which have the capacity, which we now have, but haven't implemented on the battlefield yet, to make the decisions with the human out of the loop, or the human and ancillary uh, add-on to the decision-making process, Terminator stuff. So the phrase he used, we are scared shitless, suggests to me a traumatic impact, because you have to deal with it. And I want to make the point that this applies to ordinary security professionals as well. He said, one, I was the last line of defense for a property that I could demonstrably prove was being constantly attacked. I never knew when the shoe would drop. When will they get in? I would go to sleep wondering if tonight is the night I'm awakened by a page that said we've been owned. I would pray it would be some zero day out of my control. Maybe I wasn't smart enough to be up to the job. And of course, some of you know that none of us are smart enough to do a job which is impossible to do, which is defending the entire perimeter of what no longer has a perimeter. Uh, so <clears throat> as, a, as a friend, a hacker friend said, I guess my job is to prevent the company I work for from being owned. We get owned a lot. So I guess I pretty much suck at my job. <clears throat> and we went on from there, the remediation after the fact. Um, so I pushed myself, he said, more and more. To attack, all you need is access to the internet. And according to the security community, the attacker always wins. So to defend, you just need to run a tight ship tightly enough to keep out the entire internet. It's a game you're set up to lose. If you have integrity at all, it drives you crazy. You can play, uh, but, but you can't win. So um, it's Chinatown. Now, I used that phrase in a talk I gave in New York recently. It's Chinatown, Jake. It's Chinatown. And one of the young things, that is anybody under 60, came up to me afterward and said, you know, they don't know what you mean when you say it's Chinatown. So I've learned I have to check my references because I'm old and they, they go back far. I remember a hacker at DEF CON coming up and saying, you referred to Hal in your speech. Who is Hal? <clears throat> and that's when you realize that your literary movie uh, and popular culture references have to be constantly updated. Uh, how many of you know what I mean by it's Chinatown, Jake? Does anybody know what I mean? OK, one, one person. Uh, take a weekend off sometime <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and see some movies like The Insider or Chinatown. Chinatown comes from the great Hollywood decade of the 70s. And Chinatown is a magnificent movie um, uh, about Jake Giddis, a detective. Uh, who had worked in Chinatown, and when he's asked by the woman he's trying to protect, um, what did you do in Chinatown? He said, as little as possible. As little as possible. And at the end, when the consequences of a corrupt world finally come raining down on everybody's head, his partner, to get him out of the line of fire, says, come on, Jake, go home. It's Chinatown, Jake. It's Chinatown. Uh, if you see them, seriously, see the movie. Um, we still call them movies, right? Uh, well, the names changed. It wasn't that long ago that people used to say, I'm going on the internet. Well, now nobody says, I'm going on the internet, any more than you came in here and plugged something in and said, I'm, I'm going to get on the power grid now. Uh, it, it just <laughs> disappears into the background of your life. But if you brought someone forward from 1850 to this landscape right now, the one thing that would impact them and drive them crazy with wondering what it all is are all those wires going everywhere. Uh, all these electric lights were barely a century old and uh, brand new. We're barely up from the swamp, you know? We're just little fish that are walking on fins yet. Uh, so working in this in kind of environment can undermine trust. And trust in the fabric of life what is based on what you believe is real, what you think is real. And I've already indicated that some of these people have been told that the very reality, the social structures that define their reality, uh, has been betrayed. Um, a young man recently, uh, in my experience, walked into NSA. He finally passed all his clearances, and he finally got the job he wanted, and he walked in, and he discovered 
for the first time in his life that both parents worked at NSA. W what does that do to the family narrative <laughs> when you find out that your entire life has been a fiction and that your parents have completely lied to you the whole time? Uh, it, it blows the family lie up. So inside, you know, these things are not lies. Uh, inside there, as, as Clapper said, who's now doing a great job on television, uh, I told the, uh, the least untruthful thing I could say. That's <laughs> what he said to Congress. Now, if you work inside and you work with secrets, you know that that's just the norm. You, you have to protect the secrets. This is just Operation Security. It's OPSEC. You have to, have to do it, and therefore, you're not lying. But it looks to the humplings, the hump of the bell curve in which many people still live, not you guys, you're the elite. But the humplings, it sounds like a lie <laughs> because it wasn't true. <laughs> and it may have been the least untruthful thing Clapper could say to Congress, but it was a lie, but not really. It was a cover story, and once it's a cover story, it's designated a non-lie lie. It's an essential thing that you need to say. Uh, <clears throat> as someone said in the office of um, one of the agencies, uh, the person responsible for liaising with the Brits, uh, with whom uh, Americans sometimes fantasize they have a special relationship, uh, he was saying, we really need to take care of these people. They're, you know, These are our friends, our allies, long ago, and the assistant uh, director of SIGINT said, <clears throat> excuse me, we have no friends. We have no allies. All we have are targets. And that's the hyper-real environment in which we live, in which everyone is a target of everyone, uh, everyone else. And that's why as the boundaries went down, when the information world became what it has become, uh, things that were stood up as if they belonged to nation states, uh, no longer belong to nation states. They belong to transnational sources of influence and power that do not even have names yet. They wait, wait for names to make them intelligible to the masses. Uh, and things that were supposed to be international have come home to domestic. I was talking to uh, an FBI conference once in, about that dynamic, and the special agent in charge of that particular city said, bingo, bingo, he said, I used to be able to appeal to people, Americans, that is, south of the border, uh, on the basis of patriotism. And now what I'm hearing more and more is, I would like to help you, but. And that but signifies what's become real, which is these transnational organizational structures, which are the sources of real behavior, power, and influence. You can say Microsoft is an American country, but most of its work, like Apple, is out of the country. You can say the Bank of America is the Bank of America, but it's not. It's the Bank of the World, like Citigroup with 70,000 people globally. It's causes for behavior are not national anymore. So when the CIA was stood up, it was to be an intelligence organization that did target targets everywhere outside the United States. And the FBI was a police organization intended to work within the United States, but now the FBI of necessity has offices all over the world, and the CIA works hand in glove with many domestic organizational structures, contrary to its charter, contrary to what we thought was the rule of law because the necessity of the technological comp uh, compelling condition mandates that they do that, and that's why the boundaries are down and the information transits in and out uh, in a perimeterless world, so perimeter defense is meaningless. Um, in terms of these untruthful things, uh, a, a pro told me uh, I was always getting in trouble with my wife uh, because the other wives knew more uh, and I was the navigator and ops officer. Uh, my daughter went at the Air Force Intel Officer School, was out with my wife and friends. The news brought up North Korea. She had to stop before she got into classified material. And my wife pulled her aside and said, don't worry, you can tell Daddy when we get home. He has the top secret clearance. And my daughter said, uh, no, I'm afraid I can't. He does not have the need to know. <laughs> And the man said, I smiled with pride when I heard that story. In other words, this is what happens to you as you are assimilated. <clears throat> you come to think of the family lies uh, as people being unable to talk to each other truthfully, forthrightly, and honestly, which is the basis of intimacy and relationship. You think of that as the norm. Excuse me. Uh, so this is part of what can happen to you. Uh, you develop pride in the inability to tell the truth. 
And you're dealing with unknowns all the time. And, and when people are confronted with danger or discomfort, the first thing they use as a hypothesis to explain it is what comforts them. It's not necessarily what is ad adequate to the data. It's what makes them feel better. And it's always in terms of the paradigms of the past, not the future, because the future is constantly pulling us now more and more into new structures. The instinct is conditional on fear. And so we go back to something inscribed in memory to alleviate the fear and alleviate the traumatic impact. It undermines trust not only in other people, but in our own maps of reality, and it makes for crazy-making experience. We try to build a coherent view of the world, and we find ourselves inside a Philip K. Dick novel. I'm going to do this again because I paused recently and said, and who, has, who knows who Philip K. Dick is? Okay, more hands. Rest of you, take a week off. <laughs> Read Philip K. Dick through a scanner darkly. Do androids dream of electric sheep? You've seen Blade Runner, right? Okay, Blade Runner was based on what we used to call a book. And <clears throat> it's, um, they're not always that well written. He just pulled, pulled them out of his hat and wrote, 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 wrote. Uh, he was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. Uh, and, and that's why his work stands as it does, because we live in the world that a paranoid schizophrenic is actually defining very clearly for us. We are dealing with a paranoid schizophrenic, and I won't say his name, but um, schizophrenia is probably too hard. Paranoid, uh, certifiable, those things might apply. So, um, it's crazy making, and you need to debrief. You need a friend. You need someone trusted with whom you can tell the truth whether it's a therapist or, or a family member or a colleague, you need to set aside a, an island of truthfulness where you can disclose actually what you're thinking, what you're feeling on the basis of what it is you're dealing with. You need to debrief. Uh, the Soviets are getting a lot of publicity these days as being excellent in, in the uh, dissemination through battalion level efforts of false facts. They're all over the internet, they're not just uh, in political domains, they're all over. People go to websites and it says, uh, the one I read the other day that came out of this, you know, these guys just make stuff up and put them all over the internet. This was, if you have a particular kind of toothache, the way to handle it is with crazy glue, that you put glue on your tooth. And um, people who tried it, of course, found out that they were trolled. Uh, so the Soviets are really doing a good job of embedding lies uh, in, in all sorts of places. I won't say that any, anyone else is, is doing a good job too, but it's the Soviets we focus on. And NATO has a group that does nothing but analyze propaganda coming out of Russia. Uh, and the Swedes talk about this at a conference I attend every year. Because they're on the front lines, like the Baltic states, they're really dealing with the brunt of Soviet counterintelligence propaganda. And what they discovered is the people doing the analysis of the propaganda need to be debriefed because even though they know what they're doing is reading lies for the purpose of identifying and clarifying what the lies are, they nevertheless come to believe it. Because we are built to believe. Our brains are built to believe that if it looks dangerous, it looks like something real, then act first as if it's real. You'll survive more that way more often. Uh, so the People who do that work need to be debriefed in order to understand that even though they knew consciously that what they were reading was lies, that they have absorbed some of it and integrated it seamlessly into the narrative that they tell, them, tell themselves. Um, as I said, that historian at the NSA uh, said 1945 was the last time we could count on our shared narrative meaning the same things. So the longer you spend time doing this, the more jaded or apathetic or depressed you can become. And in this hyper world, relationships and methods of communication fundamentally are changing. What do I mean by that? Um, joked with the badge that when we pulled the tape off, I said, well, now the camera can work, now the microphone can work. We joke about ubiquitous surveillance, but it's no joke. I mean, you know that the integration of these things is everywhere. When I did a talk recently on the end of privacy for some ministers of privacy um, in Canada. I could talk about the end of the individual as a constructed reality of a society uh, that is only a few hundred years old and is now on, on the way out. 
Um, and, and so we don't know who we can trust, and we don't know what's being picked up. For example, they very cleverly have a dummy video camera right there that looks as if it's making a videotape of this. The real camera is up here <laughs> to get a view of you <laughs> because, well, it, may, it might be. Uh, more and more people are saying to me, as one did not long ago in, in Vegas, he said, I want to talk to you about something. He hadn't talked to me about something. Uh, once he went to work for one of the agencies, we used to talk about his sexy work all the time. It was very cool. And then he said, well, I can't talk to you now. I send a contract. And for a number of years, we didn't talk about it, any of the real stuff anymore. And, and then he came up and he said, I need to talk to somebody. And he insisted that we go outside, leave the conference, walk down the strip in Vegas to a mall, sit on the steps with people streaming on either side of us so that the noise and ambience would mask whatever he said while he told me, I need to tell you about this thing that I did. And he told me the thing. And I said, how do you know that happened? And he said, because I did it. And if you tell anybody, uh, even if you put it into fiction, he said, the likelihood is I will be killed. So he had unburdened himself by disclosing to me this key thing. And now I am burdened with it. And I can only put it into fiction. Pause for commercial. Mind Games, collection of short stories, foam, a novel. I have a couple of copies to sell, as well as a true book called UFOs and Government, a Historical Inquiry. Uh, just a few copies. It's all you can get through customs, you know, clandestinely. Uh, <laughs> but the rest are available on the internet. I learned to my chagrin that when someone said, just send me one, that the postage to send it to Canada far exceeded the cost of the book. Uh, so I refer you to the internet, but I do have a few copies if you want to see them signed. Why did I start writing fiction again after turning to nonfiction? Because working with one of these gentlemen at NSA, he said to me that after 9-11, it was a long project on the ethics of what had transformed the agency in its response to that event. Uh, and he said, you know, you can't ever discuss what we talk about with you. And he paused and he said, a little twinkle, of course, unless you start writing fiction. He said, now fiction is the only way you can tell the truth. <laughs> and so, so it is. I've published 35 short stories since then, 19 collected in mind games, uh, foam about hackers, aliens, other things that I know are true. Uh, but they look like fiction. And one of the validations of that moment came after Snowden uh, did his thing. And someone took a photograph of a page in the first short story, Zero Day Roswell, in which a dying intelligence agent says on, a, on his deathbed, let me tell you what we do. And he boom, 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 said, these are the things we are doing now. And that was published in 2006. In 2010, post Snowden, someone photographed that page and tweeted it linked to a link to Snowden because it was bing, 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 bing. They just lined up uh, perfectly. But because mine is a short story in fiction, I can, I can travel the world freely. Uh, and Snowden, because he took the ill-advised route that he took, other routes, better ways to do it, um, he's never coming home. He's never coming home. Nobody is going to compromise with him. Um, the only way he could come home is if somehow we elected a president who favored Russia more than the United States <laughs> and who made an understanding with the Russians, that this man really is uh, a patriot. When Vladimir Putin offers a character reference for the President of the United States and says, let me share my notes with you, uh, you know you're in a hyper-real environment. You see, this is, this is insane. OK, so how we speak to one another has changed. That conversation in Vegas on the steps uh, it was like the conversation in the movie called, <laughs> here we go again, The Conversation. How many of you have seen The Conversation? Gene Hackman. Same guy. Uh, <laughs> same guy. The rest of you, I tell, take a weekend off. You, get to work. <laughs> uh, see The Conversation. On your binge weekend, see The Conversation after seeing Chinatown and The Insider. Uh, conversation is about, well, surveillance. It was written in a more primitive time, a couple of decades ago, but it's still a great movie because it talks about the ambiguity and challenges of living in this kind of, kind of world. Um, 
But when more and more people are saying to me, I can only talk to you face to face, when someone let me know when I was going to Europe for a conference, I'll meet you at the airport, ride the train from Amsterdam to Rotterdam with you so that we can get off the train, walk around the block while I tell you what's coming next and then get back on the train. When those kind of conversations can only happen that way, not all the time, but more and more, it's a significant uh, pointer to our distrust of the very environment in which we live. So we need to deal with it. Even if you're not dealing with it directly, secondary trauma can, re can result. Steve Miles, a great uh, bioethicist who outed the reality of scientific experimentation on torture victims by the United States at Abu Ghraib, by painstaking work with 3,500 documents the ACLU had managed to get through Freedom of Information Act, um, and published a book called Oath Betrayed because doctors are not supposed to work from torture to torture to torture, learning as they go because this violates the Nuremberg Conventions, which we ourselves wrote at one time. He says that, told me, after a day of reading endless descriptions of arbitrary brutality, I dreamed I was in Abu Ghraib. I woke up sweating, my heart pounding. Later, I was overcome by sadness. I stopped writing my book out of a sense of utter futility. This is secondary trauma. This is what it does. He said, in a state like the one we have created, people are asking him all the time, aren't you afraid you'll be killed? Aren't you afraid you'll be killed for saying these things? He said, that's a secondary effect of living in a torturous society that this is what people come to fear, and then we act on what we fear, and then it becomes the reality of the social network. Um, secondary trauma, he was told. He was advised to spend time with family, to spend time with friends, gardening, uh, music, coming out of scenes of unspeakable devastation. He says he goes to a town in Italy three, four days, just sits in cafes, talks to people and reestablish links with what we call normal uh, in, in order to assuage his own tortured soul because the devastation. A week in a small town with a decent fish market, he says, after six weeks of a parade of dump trucks loaded with bodies. Uh, it's the last test of my strategy developed over the years. It beats breaking down and sobbing in a grocery market because I got the cultural bends from ascending too fast from my first experience in a guerrilla war zone. So this is the voice of experience, and I encourage you to consider it. We're dealing with this now with drones. People who live in Vegas, Nellis, wherever, uh, spend time with their families, dinner, soccer game for the kids, wake up in the morning, go into war, they're in a shed, they're at a screen, 12 hours of war, killing people, sometimes by mistake, sometimes not, coming out, home to dinner. Uh, wife says, how was your day, dear? And as I said, in a world of secrecy, all you can do is say, it was fine. A friend who said he was told about all the 12-step programs, alcoholics and drugs anonymous and so on, when he joined the agency, and he said, why do you need these? And he was told, when you've listened in real time to terrorists slitting the throats of victims, and you go home and all you can do is tell your wife it was a fine day at the office. You'll learn why we need these groups. Um, and in InfoSec, I remember someone sitting in his office sobbing after a breach had compromised his entire organization. He said, I have encountered the face of evil. This is when you know good and evil exists. You don't know how to define it, but you know it when you see it. So it can kill relationships. It can lead to a constant sense of danger and hypervigilance. Paranoia slowly sets in, said one. Is somebody following me? They're always watching. They're always doing operational security in the street. They go into a restaurant. I met someone from CIA, and even though they'd been out for a while, they sat in the corner, back to the wall, being able to see everyone as they came in. When I'm in Israel, I do that. I guarded the door to prevent suicide bombers. Uh, and you always check out the exits. You look to see where can you duck if something is anomalous or unusual. Um, last night, a guy got up on the plane next to me, a very big guy, and he started wandering up and down the aisle, and he kept trying to change seats. 
And I made sure I had my uh, ballpoint pen in my pocket because after 9-11, a, a pilot announced on a commercial flight, I know you can't bring a knife, he said, but you can bring a big pen. And the place to put it is right up through the juggler. And then you have the additional pleasure of reading big pen between his teeth when he screams. So it's the kind of world we live in. So I noticed the anomalous behavior and checked with the stewardess, because he went up to the stewardess, and I thought he's hassling the stewardess. You know how much video there has been of flight problems these days. And she said, no, no, no. Uh, the guy he was sitting next to has a very bad case of flatulence, and he couldn't take it anymore. So, uh, but, but you immediately suspect uh, danger. Um, and then when you enter the real world, says some of my colleagues, you have to pretend you don't have certain skills. Or if somebody brings up a subject, you have to think quickly, is this available publicly, like on news or the internet, so that I can refer to it and speak of it, or did I know about it only because of the nature of my work, and as a result, you hold back more and more. I begin every encounter with a new person, said one, in a state of distrust my entire life. And as one said, I have been so many different people presenting personas in so many different guises for so many years that I must have a real core self somewhere, but I put it down long ago and I have forgotten where I put it. So, this leads to uh, serious trauma. You have a standard line to get people off topic so they can't talk to you about what you're really doing. Uh, and yet, I may be paranoid, said a friend in an essay, but they are out to get us. And working in a granular way with what they are doing, and they as everybody, uh, makes you know that. So, so you live in fear, you're hypervigilant, you live under constant threats, and this creates trauma. High stress, hell yes. From what? Hacking into a foreign government's computers? Knowing if your presence is discovered, the sysadmin will be executed for failing to perform their duties properly. You see, the problem there is letting them change from an enemy into a human being, and then feeling responsibility for being the cause of the torture and death of another human being. It weighs on some people. That's moral harm. Hearing my coworkers die as they are bombed while manning listening posts in communication areas under manhole covers in foreign countries, said one, listening to their death screams. Leads to ethical issues. It leads to binary thinking. It leads to a loss of identity, integrity, and authenticity. And it leads to a challenge to your whole moral fabric of being. InfoSec 2, where I worked, there were folks with the secret clearance, folks with top secret that worked on more of the same, but with greater access to mostly the same stuff as secret. Uh, and they often had that faraway stare. Inevitably, the question of how they liked their work would come up. Most did not, or would not answer. Some answered in a roundabout way. The work's very important, or you know you're helping to save lives. The kind of thing I just did is a rationalization to say this work has got to be done. And it does, but you emphasize that. One guy said, I can't answer that question. I asked if that was because his work was classified, and he said, no, he just truthfully didn't know. And he said, you're brought up in a world where you're taught certain things are right or wrong. You're faced with what's wrong, but you have to do it anyway. The security analyst nature of knowing and analyzing choices and knowing how much of yourself you're putting into each decision and which choices you can live with, and then those are the choices that aren't made by the higher-ups. And then you never discuss these things or this problem with another human being because you're afraid you'll lose your job for telling secrets, or worse, that your peers will think you are weak. You can't show weakness in front of a peer, and so you can't win. Even when you make the right choice, you have to learn to live with your victory in silence for the same reason. A friend of the CIA did a very good job as part of a team to track down a Pakistani assassin who killed two CIA employees in front of the agency. And they went there and they got him and they brought him back and he was executed. 
and went into the director's office and she was given a plaque for the work she had done and then she handed the plaque back because it never happened and she wasn't there. And then you live with that secret success as well. Seeing that thousand yard stare on others around me would wear on me, said my friend, and I didn't even see what they saw. I would say, are you okay? And it didn't seem to help either of us, especially them, when all they could say, the world is a bleeped up place. The world is a bleeped up place. I once held a senior person from NSA while he sobbed. And he said, I killed people. I tried, but was I arrogant? Did I do enough? Is it enough what I did? He wanted forgiveness and absolution. 11 people died on the mission that he had supported with intelligence work. I asked his opinion on torture, and he said, inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. But what happens if you have a strong ethical conscience, strong moral conscience? You might not get a job at the agency. One friend who's really brilliant and has made quite a name for himself in InfoSec applied to different agencies and he was told, you know, you're going to do great in life, but we can't have you. You scored way too high on ethical. <laughs> uh, I wish that was a joke. Um, an ethical, a strong conscience is more dangerous inside an agency sometimes than a mole because it means you're unpredictable. And if you're not predictable, it's not good. Uh, you looking at your watch? Five minutes? Okay, five minutes per each of the three or six sections I have left? <laughs> no, five minutes, okay. Let, let me, um, well, you can't ever get it all in and you don't try because sometimes you say the same talk elsewhere but you want to make sure it's different anecdotes. Um, I was told the agency does filter out people with a strong conscience because they're punished. You're not a team player. Team player means you go along to get along. The real, burden, royal, the real moral burden for many of us, said a CIA person, is being complicit in crimes against humanity is the price for keeping the job. I was publicly indicted under the Espionage Act, said one, declared indigent by the court. I faced decades in prison. My life has been turned upside down. I've already lived a dystopian Orwellian future. When I worked the tech ops mission, said one, the pointy end of the stick, I had a heavy moral burden getting to face to face with people I had to lie to, but for the greater good. Our assets and their families were always, families were always at risk. Assets are too valuable to treat casually, but still, you had to let them get killed sometime to protect the bigger issue. It was important to remember that we were working with real people and not playing with chess pieces. There was heartbreak when we couldn't warn a friendly about something bad that was likely to happen. Notice the language. A friendly about something bad that was likely to happen. A friend and colleague was about to be tortured to death. And I couldn't tell him that I knew it because it would jeopardize the mission. It would jeopardize our sources and methods. We had long discussions about these things and they weren't taken lightly. Well, thank you. But it was still hard to sleep at night. Who pays the price for these missions? The people doing them. Again, as that CIA person said, who worked to find bin Laden, it takes so long to train good analysts, yet managers are so careless in burning people out too quickly. We have to make it viable somehow to make it a long distance job. And as one said from CIA, when I was a high performance case officer, we had five times the regional average in recruitments and production of intelligence reports. He was good at what he did. I was for a while an observer to the personnel management working group in the DO, the Director of Operations. I noted that we were obscenely proud of having the highest rates of alcoholism, adultery, divorce, and suicide in the US government. I personally have 23 professional suicides in my mental logbook. The first an instructor that blew his brains out with a shotgun when I was in training. The latest have tended to be senior figures who could not live with what they knew. Now, if you work in an agency or organization, you can see a therapist. I don't have time to go into it, but I have a long document from someone who set up the EAP program at one of the major agencies, and the biggest enemy to the work were the intelligence people themselves 
because they wanted everyone who went into therapy to have the reports of their therapy reported to the intelligence side so they could be dealt with. Um, it is laughable, said one, to think of a psychiatrist inside working with someone having a crisis of conscience and suggesting they blow the whistle on a particular practice because that would posit a moral point of view and a point of reference outside the agency. Yes, it is indeed laughable. About alcoholism at CIA, Stanfield Turner, former director, said, yes, it's a problem, but we prefer not to talk about it. Uh, this book I mentioned, UFOs and Government, I'm gonna just say one thing about it because it's relevant to this last point. A team of us worked for five years using documents we had gathered for over 50 years. Uh, every single footnote, and there are nearly a thousand of them in this book, points to a government document we have managed to secure or a primary source. The book is called UFOs in Government, a Historical Inquiry, because what we analyze is how the government responded to the real phenomena, which it knew was real and not visionary or fictitious. That's a quote from a general's memo in the 40s. Um, from the 40s to the 80s. We show why they managed it in light of national security concerns above all, because of what it was doing to the body, the body politic as these reports came in and people got swept up in the mania. We had to debunk it, they said, in 1953, after a long incident took place in Washington, D.C., that is, UFOs over the Capitol and the White House, scrambling jets from three air bases. We have the radar screens from that incident. We have the transcripts of the conversations with the conning tower. Um, everything in the, in the book is documented, but we had to debunk it, CIA and Air Force concluded, at the same time do the real research, which they have done over the next decades, in order to try to identify the sources of power that make this power train work in a way that we can't do blowing gas out of our ass and pushing forward. That's no way to make a, an object go from zero to 10,000 uh, in, in a matter of seconds. The people who have had encounters with anomalous phenomena, my point being, show the same kind of trauma because they now have a burden of something that they know is real, but which is debunked and ridiculed. Uh, the three cornerstones of cover and deception, says a friend who taught this at the agency, are illusion, misdirection, and ridicule. And the greatest of these is ridicule. You create illusions that people believe. You make people, if it's right there, look over here. And if you ridicule the witness, which is a long-standing uh, technique that lawyers know, uh, you destroy their credibility, you destroy their reputation, and pretty soon people shut down and won't talk about it. It has been very, very effective. They engaged the whole entertainment community that they could, witting agents, in order to promulgate the idea that anyone who talks about this subject is crazy. So crazy I may be, but we have documented everything in that book. Uh, so, I have to conclude because five minutes are pretty much up. As I said, family, friends, crazy stuff like gardening, getting your fingers in the dirt, getting your brain somewhere else, listening to music, uh, using techniques like yoga and meditation. Meditation, mindfulness, mindfulness, becoming fully conscious because trauma goes into the body and the body then reacts as if it's present in the current moment and becoming present to your body again so you can short circuit the memory, that loop, that closed loop, mindfulness, therapy, mutuality, communities of redemption and discourse, like those 12-step communities, uh, doing what works, and managing our grandiose egos. What we don't know is so much bigger than we are, and we get caught up in the importance of what we think we're doing. The brain will be trained to do what you want to train it to do, it is a good dog. I knew a professor who was blind who could go to a party and tell you every conversation that was taking place in a crowded, noisy room because he had trained his brain to compartment and assimilate and integrate. He listened to what we called cassette tapes. How many of you remember, how many of you know what a cassette tape is? Okay, more hands, little, little cassette. He listened to those at six times normal speed because he trained his brain to, <laughs> to discern the meaning of the words at that speed. It's like listening to an alien. Uh, you can train your brain, it's called plasticity. I mean, it's not gonna do everything, but if you're learning braille and you're blind, for example, the part of the brain dedicated to the sensitivity of the fingertips enhances itself with many, many more neuronal connections, for example. We can do that in many areas of work. The executive function, the prefrontal cortex, directs your intentionality. 
and then your mindfulness and awareness of what you're doing and feedback loops, mutuality, feedback, accountability. Be mindful and vigilant. Trauma does have hidden creative properties and people who transcend it and deal with it and become more than it are greater, stronger, and more resilient, and more powerful than those who have never dealt with it in the first place. So we don't want to stop these challenges, but we want to manage them appropriately, integrate them, and transcend the impact of what they do if we're unconscious about them. So this is an encouragement to be mindful and vigilant over your lifetime, over the arc of your professional career, and recognize that there is a core self that may have criteria and values that aren't always supported by the organizational structure or its culture. And it's your job to create an alternative culture where you can at least go in order to true up and become more true to that core self you have discovered, which is essential in order to re realize a viable life. So that as you get older, you realize you have this torch for just a few moments. And you want to make it burn as brightly as you can. And you want to be all used up when you die. Take that from an old man. It's true. OK, all done. If somebody wants a book at the Canadian exchange rate, these are a bargain. Same dollar value. <laughs> 74 cents a dollar, $25 US is now what? 20 times 0.74. What a deal. Just a few. <laughs> but you can also get them uh, online, of course, digitally, Nook, uh, Kindle, and, and that. Okay, thank you for being attentive. I really appreciate it. Thank you.